is a series of videos which we are preparing on who really needs IVF. How to know about whether you are really a candidate who will be benefited by the treatment of IVF and ICE. In today's subtopic will be which are the patients suffering from polycystic ovary syndrome who will need IVF. In this video, I will be giving you a brief introduction of polycystic ovary and then we will go to what are the scenarios in polycystic ovary wherein an IVF will be a much better option for you to have a pregnancy. Polycystic ovary syndrome is pretty common. In my own practice, almost about 15 to 20 percent of the women who are consulting me for infertility are suffering from polycystic ovary. But in the general community, anything about 2 to 7 percent, depending upon what ethnicity you are and which part of the country you, are, you come from or which part of the world you are, the chance of polycystic ovary will be there. Polycystic ovary syndrome is supposed to be a both a genetic disorder as well as a lifestyle disorder. But it is a lifestyle, more of a lifestyle disorder nowadays, because it is a lifestyle which is a very modifiable factor which spoils a lady with polycystic ovary syndrome or can benefit a lady with polycystic ovary syndrome. Polycystic ovary syndrome is characterized by three main things and this has been established by the Rotterdam bacterias. And they are somebody who is having irregular menses. So if your menstrual cycles are beyond 35 days or less than 21 days, that's called irregular cycles. Secondly, if you are having excess body hair. In the Indian scenario, having a little bit of upper lip hair is pretty common. But having excess body hair, wherein you require to visit your cosmetologist very frequently or you have to visit your beauty parlor very frequently for your threading sessions. Or there could be excess hair between your breast, around the umbilicus, or hair on the forearm and forelegs, which are cosmetically damaging, and that it is something definitely will be classified as excess hair, and these women should be conscious and rule out whether they are having polycystic ovary syndrome. Last criteria is polycystic looking ovary on sonography. By this, a gynecologist or a radiologist will do a transvaginal sonography. Mind it, it is transvaginal sonography only. You cannot label somebody having polycystic ovaries on ultrasound doing it from abdomen. It has to be done transvaginal using 8 megahertz probe. And if you are having more than 20 anterior follicle count of the ovary, then that is known as polycystic ovary. Out of these three criteria, if any two are positive, the patient is supposed to be suffering from polycystic ovary syndrome. But there is one more factor which definitely spoils the patients who are having polycystic ovary syndrome and that is the insulin resistance. Insulin resistance or metabolic syndrome, also known as syndrome X, is very rampant in Indian government. Probably, this metabolic syndrome is one of the hallmarks of a civilized society. We have grown from hunter-gatherer years to a civilized society wherein a lot of our work is done sedentarily, more in the world of internet and mobile, most of our fingers are doing most of the work and our mobility has come down. Hence, because of a sedentary lifestyle and a spoiled food habits which could be very high in trans fat and in carbohydrates we generally become more obese and the polycystic ovary syndrome starts uh, exhibiting itself in a more rampant nature in our society. And this in scientific language is also called insulin resistance. And this insulin resistance would be characterized by there would be increased symptoms of craving for food. So you are having sweet, more amount of sweet food. There will be darkening of the skin and that is called acanthesis nigrans. As it is shown in this slide, wherein the, neck, in the back of the neck is seen and you can see a dark patch there. A lot of women may think it's an allergy to the necklace they are wearing. No, it is darkening because of obesity and this is a hallmark of insulin resistance. Your knuckles will become dark, your axilla will become dark, your armpits will become dark that is. Your area below the breast, around your uh, pubic area, if that is that skin is becoming darker, tougher and it will be small minuscule papillae coming on that that is a typical of insulin resistance. Also, there will be increased amount of hunger and thirst. There could be a frequent urination and there could be, some of the women may feel some tingling sensation of hands and feet. But the 
hallmark feature of insulin resistance which really spoils the polycystic ovary is the acanthosis nigrans or the darkening of the skins as I mentioned to you. What are the tests we do once we diagnose somebody who is suffering from polycystic ovary? I'm sure your doctor must have done this test but see to it that these following tests which I am narrating are done with you. One is anti mullerian hormone or AMH. Generally, women with polycystic ovary will have a high AMH. Second, on day 3 of the cycle or menstrual cycle, if you have undergone a test, blood test of serum LH and serum FSH levels. Whether a detailed sonography has been done, where ovarian volume in centimeter cube is mentioned and the anterior follicle count with the number of follicles per ovary are clearly mentioned and these are the things which are going to indicate the severity of polycystic ovary. Whether you have undergone a test of glycosylated hemoglobin, so are you a potentially diabetic? That's what it tells. You must undergo a lipid profile. So after 10 hours of fasting, cholesterol and lipid profile should be done. So you should know whether you are suffering from metabolic syndrome and a serum free testosterone level, which tells us your amount of hyperandrogenism you have. Hyperandrogenism, it's a very, you may feel that it's a complicated word. Hyperandrogenism just means more amount of maleness in that lady. Suppose a lady has more amount of male features in the form of coarseness of voice or balding, typically male pattern of balding, forget I don't have hair, male pattern of balding and hair loss or an excess hair, male pattern of excess hair that is indicative of polycystic ovary. What is the purpose of these tests? These tests are basically known to phenotype a polycystic ovary. The polycystic ovary has four classifications. There is an A, B, C, D variety. It's actually it's not called classification, it's called phenotyping in my science. So A is a classic type of polycystic ovary, which is the worst. B, C, D, and the severity of the disease comes in a decreasing order. So if you have an A type of polycystic ovary, more likely you have a severe format of polycystic ovary syndrome. Also, these tests will tell us to estimate the severity. You know, I always give an analogy of a spectacle number. A spectacle is a very acceptable thing in our society. Likewise, we should accept polycystic ovary. A large number of our women would have irregular sex. Doesn't mean they are bad. It is just a variation which has been gifted to them by God. As my lens of the eye is weak, it's not a disease. It's gifted to me by God that way and I have to correct it by wearing a spectacle. But everybody's spectacle is a different number. Let's have an AMH value instead of a spectacle number. So AMH tells you how bad is a polycystic ovary. Now if my spectacle number is minus 10, probably I have a very high refractory index. Problem, myopia, high myopia. Similarly, if somebody is AMH is very high, then that would be a severe case of polycystic ovary. This I have just told you to make you understand what AMH indicates. And also we want to detect here whether we are having a modifiable factor. For example, HbA1c, highly modifiable. Lipid profile, modifiable factor. You have a high testosterone level, where well, it is a treatable factor. So these are modifiable factor, which will decrease your severity from worse to good, and then probably you will become better conducive to achieve a early pregnancy. The initial treatments which are offered to patients of polycystic ovary syndrome is first diet and lifestyle adjustments, low carbohydrate diet. Exercise schedules, you know, strengthening exercises, cardio exercises, everything is important. Then a lot of women would go through ovulation induction cycles using letrozole, promethine, or HMG injections. Some of you might have also undergone laparoscopic ovarian drilling, though it is a procedure which is going a little low in fashion. And some of you might have taken some cycles of intrauterine insemination or IUI. Now, after these initial treatments are over, many of the women with polycystic ovary don't achieve a pregnancy. I would say about 50% they may not achieve pregnancy with these initial treatments. Why? The main reason is in polycystic ovary, the main pathology is you are not forming an egg by day 14 if you have menses. So suppose you want to give medicine, we want to form only one egg. But this polycystic ovary is stupidly hypersensitive. When a small amount of drug is given, probably the egg doesn't form. You increase the drug, extra doesn't form. You increase the dose, and that probably is the optimum dose for that patient. 
and suddenly instead of having 1x, you suddenly have 20x, which is not desired as shown in the slide. But when you do an IVF, that's what is the major change you make here. You literally stimulate the lady so that you go to that non-desired level of follicular intelligence. So you develop large number of follicles, which is very easy to develop in a patient of polycystic ovary, and that eases out your procedure of idea. To develop one egg would be difficult for many women suffering from polycystic ovary, but to develop 10-15 egg is pretty easy. By increasing the dose of baratoprofen, you can develop that egg, and you can then take the eggs out and go ahead with the whole procedure of idea. Before I go to the procedure of IVF, which I'll be covering in the next video, I'm going to tell you now the crux of this presentation. What are the different scenarios wherein you require to need, require to go for IVF when your case of polycystic ovary is low? So, are you a severe polycystic ovary? Somebody who is having a high AMH. So, whatever lady is there who is chasing fertility, she must know where she is there on the dial of AMH. You can visit our video of Christine Women's Hospital on YouTube on where you stand on the dial of AMH and that will give you a clear glance of how AMH is important when it comes to your fertility prognosis. So women who have an AMH high, I would say roughly beyond 8 nanograms, tend to require IVF more in practice or are difficult for ovulation induction and they could be having multiple failures with simple treatments and going for a higher treatment would be better off. Women whose ovary that's shown on the slide is very thick ovaries with large amount of white areas in the center and peripherally a small ring of small cysts or that's what it's called polycystic ovary. And whenever the stroman amount is high and ovaries with high volume are there, they are generally associated with high LH levels. On the second or third day of the period, if you have done your blood test of LH and if this LH is beyond 12, your chance that you will require IVF will increase. Please don't misunderstand me that everybody who has an AMH beyond 8 and AMH beyond 12 definitely requires IVF. No, I don't want to say that. What I'm saying is with these parameters, you already having these parameters and if you are not successful at ovulation induction cycles and laparoscopic ovarian drilling and things like that, please think of IVF. That would be a better option for you. Whenever you have ovaries which are having a large number of follicles, so random follicle count is beyond 25, beyond 30, then the chance that you will require IVF is more. Rather, I would say these are the women who should definitely think IVF as a forefront of their management of polycystic ovary to achieve pregnancy. Patients who have taken multiple cycles of injections and somebody has taken let's say 150 IU of gonadotrophin dose every day for 8 to 10 doses and in spite of 8 to 10 doses their eggs have not formed or eggs have not grown then this is a lady who probably will be benefited with IVF and if you are undergone repeated failed IUR cycles and you are a patient of polycystic ovary the chance of having an IVF pregnancy increases. Some women also suffer from eating disorders and depression which are also hormone of polycystic ovary syndrome. The new guidelines which have been published at Barcelona Conference in 2018 have said that eating disorders and depression is recognized as a symptom of polycystic ovary. So, if the lady is obese and she has done ample number of attempts of doing diet and exercise and maybe a course of ectosa injections and sadly her obesity is not getting controlled and it is putting her into a vicious cycle. But because of obesity, her treatment is becoming difficult, she is required to use a higher dose and her success rate is coming down. In these women, doing IVF will be better because IVF gives that opportunity of giving a certain dose of gonadotrophin to develop the X. If it has been about more than 4-6 to six years of married life and you are a known case of polycystic ovary, you have taken a few treatments, you are not successful and you have done ovulation induction, you have formed the egg but not achieved pregnancies. And about four to six years of married life is already over. I think you should be doing. You should be thinking of trying with an IVF. Because well, there could be some more subtle factor which could be responsible for you not achieving a pregnancy and doing IVF would be better. Uh, why is it four to six years? Is four years is more applicable for somebody who is beyond 32 years, and six years is more applicable for somebody who is about maybe 24 or 25 years and trying pregnancy? They could be associated reproductive disorders in patients of PCOS. 
What happens in polycystic ovaries? For years together, you are anovulatory. That means you are not forming an egg and rupturing it. Because of that, your estrogen levels in the body remain high. And that predisposes you for certain reproductive disorder like adenomyosis, endometriosis and fibroid. So if you are suffering from one of these reproductive disorders, there is no point giving simplistic ovulation inductions in trying for pregnancy. IVF is a far better option. Some of you could be having a husband who is having oligospermy. So you are having a polycystic ovary and husband has a marginal oligospermy and the sperm pump is low. It is very difficult to make the ends meet. So probably you will ovulate with a certain ovulation induction agent. At that time, the husband is not able to produce a good sperm pump. With treatment, the husband may produce a good sperm pump, but the PCOS lady is not ovulating in that particular cycle. So there is a frustrating and depressing experience to go through repeated cycles of ovulation and induction because both need to be corrected in the same cycle and that will be difficult to achieve. In these combinations, when you have a polycystic ovary wife with a low sperm pump husband, an IVF will be a faster option to achieve a pregnancy. Then why IVF is the good option or the best option to achieve patients uh, pregnancy in women suffering from polycystic ovary? Number one, out of all treatments, your promethine, letrozole, IUIs and laparoscopic ovary drilling, IVF has the best success rate. Secondly, uh, you can do IVF multiple times. No, I am not saying multiple IVF attacks, it is single attack. You do IVF once, give an optimum dose, get good number of eggs out and have more number of embryos formed. So instead of going for one embryo transfer, you can go for multiple embryo transfer. This I will cover in the next video again. But remember, in PCOS, whenever you are having a PCOS, you will go for one IVF cycle, but you will take multiple embryo transfers in that cycle. So your chance of cumulative pregnancy rate over that period definitely increases. The risk of IVF having problems in polycystic ovaries is definitely high. The risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. But that is the risk of yesteryears. Today, we are using GNRH agonist Lucrel to trigger the ovulation when we do over pickup. And because of that, the chance of OHSS has become very negligible and IVF is now is becoming more and more safe in women suffering from polycystic ovary. As I told you in the earlier slide, that you give a certain dose of gonadotropin injection or certain treatment, the egg doesn't form. And you give certain dose, the multiple eggs form. And with multiple eggs, the risk of OHSS increases. And that's why simple ovulation induction is not giving you a pregnancy. And doctor and you are struggling to manage your things. When you do IVF, you purposefully give a higher dose. You purposefully form more number of follicles. And you get those many follicles out. So the IVF demands more follicles should be there. So, and the risk of OHSS is low because you are using a loop like trigger. And that's why, that's why IVF becomes more safer. And since IVF is associated with the highest number of cumulative pregnancy rate, what I mean here? But here, suppose you do 5 IUI cycles, your cumulative pregnancy rate would be maybe 40%. But if you do 1 IVF and 2 embryo transfers or 3 embryo transfers, anyway your cumulative pregnancy rate would cross beyond 40%. Uh, well, thank you. That was the information about why and who needs IVF in PCOS. In next video, we will be doing step by step protocol of IVF procedure in women suffering from polycystic. Thank you so much for watching this video and do visit our Facebook page Sulanda Fertility Clinic to like our page and also to have more information 